Father, we want to come to you in genuine dependence. We want to come, Lord, relying on you to open this book to our hearts and to open our minds Lord, that we may receive your way of seeing things, your perspective on truth. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us, that you'll help me, Lord, to just share the relevant things and Leave unsaid what doesn't need to be said. We look to you, Lord, for your grace and pray that you'll really bless this time together. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, we'll see if all the, uh, the equipment worked tonight. <laughs> and uh, welcome. Good evening and welcome to New Covenant Church, Bracknell. And for any who are listening um, later than tonight, welcome to you as well. We're glad to have you with us. We've had quite a break since the last time we were together. So um, part of what I'm going to do is actually to try and link up with what we did previously. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're doing Romans and... Um, we're in our, what I'm calling our kind of second series. There's lots of S's here. There are series and there are sessions and there are, there's another S I've forgotten now as well. Um, sections, that's right. We're breaking it up into sections and then there are series. There are three series. We're in the second one now. And what we did in the first one uh, were those three things that we've got in front of us there. We did an introduction. And then um, we looked at the whole issue of Paul bringing the accusation of guilty really against the whole human race. And then showing what God's remedy for that had been, which is being justified by faith. So we did that. And now what we're doing is we're coming into this uh, next section, which is uh, series two. And really is this section that I'm calling from death to life. Um, I think the first four chapters are partly a kind of a foundation for what's going to come. And Paul establishes, particularly, we've said this before, but particularly he's dealing with sins as offenses, that's to say individual violations of law, so that you can score it. You know, you can say that was wrong, that was wrong, that was wrong. But as he comes into chapter 5, he begins to change his imagery, and he begins to speak of sin not just as a series of transgressions against a known law, but he begins to speak about sin as a power, a power that controls people's lives. <clears throat> and I think this is the part of um, Romans which is often neglected, so we'll see how we get on with it. Okay, so we're going to look at um, from death to life. This is just to tell you what we've done so far. Um, the first time we were together in this second series, we did a recap of series one. Then in the second one, we did something that we gave the title of Father Abraham has many sons. And we talked about how faith makes us sons of Abraham and how that brings us into the blessings that God had promised to Abraham. And then the last time we were together, which is now last year, of course, because we're now in 2015, um, we looked at the story of two men. And I'm going, because that's a few weeks away now, I'm going to kind of recap that a little bit because it provides the foundation for what I want to say next. And just to put you in the picture of the whole thing, we now have six studies, because these studies are every second Thursday in the month and every fourth Thursday in the month until the end of March. So in fact, um, we shall end this series, series two, um, hopefully, uh, on the Thursday the 26th of March. <clears throat> now this is what we're going to do tonight. We're going to recap this 
um, story of the two men, Adam and Christ. And then we're going to move on from that, but keeping the same theme. And we're going to talk about the story of two men, the old and the new, and see how Adam and Christ become the old man and the new man, um, and see what Paul is saying about this. Then we're going to have a look at something that I'm calling co-crucifixion. I'll explain that when we get to it. And then we'll wind up by seeing the way that Paul begins to apply these truths. Very often in Paul's letters, you have a sort of um, a doctrinal, a technical, devotional bit at the beginning. And then as you move towards the end, you begin to get the application. If this is the case, this is the impact it has upon our lives. And we'll see that begin to happen here. So we'll talk about reckoning on reality. There's a very famous verse in Romans chapter 6 <clears throat> that will be good for us to look at and to be sure that we understand what it really means, that we're not making presumptions about it. And then finally, we're going to have a look at uh, how we refuse to submit to sin's reign, how we live a life of victory, what the implications of that are. <clears throat> so, thinking about the story of the two men, and uh, we began to speak about congenital sin. And I said this was my particular title for it. And the only reason I call it this rather than original sin or hereditary sin is that because um, the way that sin is transmitted from Adam to us, the Bible doesn't really tell us in very great detail. And if you begin to talk about hereditary, it sounds as though it's maybe coming down the family lines from one generation to another. I personally don't think that's the way it happens. I think it infected the whole race, uh, present, Adam and Eve, and future in the one moment. It was like dropping a, some blue ink into some uh, water. It spread everywhere instantly. And we said, as we came into that passage, that Paul really was beginning to ask a question which and I said, if we think about it, this really is a very logical question. And these are the questions that um, Paul is answering when he comes to this question of uh, the sin nature. This is what it is. If it is true that without the law, there's no transgression. We said this, didn't we, that without the law, there's no transgression because you can't score sin unless you actually know what the list of the laws is. So there's no list of sins that can't be quantified, that can't be measured when there is no law. <clears throat> so Paul says that without law there's no transgression. And if that's true, then the people who lived between Adam and Moses before the law came in, well, they had no score against them. So why did they die? Why did they die? If they didn't transgress the law because the law hadn't been given, why did they die? What has happened to the human race that has made death endemic? Um, <clears throat> and we discovered really that the problem goes much deeper than we knew. And we looked at a long passage of scripture, which is from the letter to the Romans. Um, and it's, it's actually just 10 verses, but it really is densely packed with information. It's one of the most uh, dense, compact bits of um, Paul's writing that you could ever find. I think it really is kind of heavy stuff, and you need to read it slowly and work your way through it. But this is the point I wanted to make fairly simply. It's this, that in this section of Romans, from Romans 5, chapter 12 to chapter 21, to verse 21, 12, verses 12 to verse 21, Paul is actually talking, to begin with, about one man. And uh, you can see this if you actually maybe just underline certain things in the letter to the Romans. And uh, you'll find that seven times in this passage, Paul uses the phrase one. He's talking about one man. He has a particular individual in mind. 
This is one man. And he tells us that what has happened to the human race is really the result of what one man did. And he begins in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 by saying, by one man, sin entered the world through disobedience. So sin, we said this last time, sin is older than the human race. It didn't just start with Adam. <clears throat> it was a lot older than the human race. But it became part of the human race as a result of Adam yielding to that particular temptation and sin entered our world. Okay, so he talks about one man and the implications of that one man's action. We'll list those again briefly in a moment. But then in this same session uh, passage of scripture, Paul has another man in mind as well. And uh, you'll see it here. Uh, this time I've underlined them, uh, kind of circled them. Four, four of these there are. And this second one man that Paul has in mind is Jesus Christ. So he's got two men in his mind as he's thinking. He's thinking of one man, Adam, and the impact of Adam upon the human race. And he's thinking of another one man, Jesus Christ, and the impact of that one man on the human race. And we'll see how this kind of works out. This is kind of recapping what we did the last time. Adam, the first man, and his legacy. And these were the things we said last time, that as a result of Adam's uh, disobedience, through one man, sin entered the world. That's Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. And then we saw this, that by one man's offense, many died. Death came into the world following sin as the result of Adam's transgression. And all death in our race is indirectly caused by Adam. There's a sense in which Adam died twice. He died on the day he transgressed, the day he sinned. God said, in the day that you eat of it, you will die. Surely you will die, I think our old King James Version says. The Hebrew idiom actually says, dying you will die. It's a strong way of expressing something. That isn't speaking about physical death because Abraham, uh, sorry, Adam lived over 900 years after that day. But Adam did die on that day. And he was expelled, if you remember, you remember the Bible picture, he's expelled from the Garden of Eden and the way, the return route is blocked off so he cannot access the tree of life. So he is a dying man for 900 years before he actually died. But as regards his relationship with God, he was dead to God. Something in, had, in Adam had died. He was no longer the man that God had intended him to be. Um, so by one man's offense, many died. <clears throat> and then it says, uh, through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. And Paul goes on to say this, uh, as it results in condemnation. In one of our earlier sessions, I tried to distinguish between judgment and condemnation. Now, English Bibles don't always make a distinction, but they're two quite different words. Judgment is the process of judging. That's what happens in the courtroom. Condemnation is the sentence that is declared and the carrying out of it. Now, God had already pre-given the, the, the judgment in that he said, in the day that you eat of it, you will die. But his being banished from the garden actually carried through the execution so that Adam died at that day. And this is the thing that I wanted to kind of draw out at that time. <clears throat> Some people think that that means that men are automatically, from Adam's first sin, they're automatically destined for hell because of this condemnation. I was suggesting the last time we were together that really the condemnation is very clearly expressed in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3. And that really the condemnation actually is to be cut off from God. And what I said the last time we were together is that if people ultimately reject God's offer of love, refuse to repent, then they will go to hell. They will be eternally separated from God. But that will be as a consequence of their own sin. 
the judgment, the condemnation that we experience, being cut off from God by first birth, is the result of Adam's sin. Okay. By one man's uh, disobedience, many were made sinners. <clears throat> and the Bible word is actually constituted. I don't know whether I'm pushing it too far in saying this, but it is as though Adam received a new constitution. He was one thing before this sin came in, but from the moment the sin came into the human race, his constitution was changed. On a couple of occasions, I have uh, wept my way through Auschwitz. I have lots of links with Polish things, and I've been a couple of times, and I've been to Majdanek, and they are unbelievable places. It's almost unbelievable that human beings could do that to other human beings. And some people would say, but this is human beings behaving like animals. But animals don't behave like this. There is something in the cruelty of human beings, in their animosity, in their rebellion, that far surpasses anything that we see in the natural world. There's something that's happened to man's constitution, which has made him a different kind of creature to the one that God made him right at the very beginning. And God has a solution for that. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. And again, going on very quickly, uh, we're going to look at Christ, the second man, and his legacy. And we, we, we said, if you remember, we'll touch on this a little bit more, um, that these are the consequences of Christ's death. The gift of grace. I've been in conversation recently with quite a few people about grace. And faith, grace is just so wonderful. Everything begins with grace. In the beginning, God. That means God is the initiator, yes, initiator of everything. And consequently, everything that we receive that's of any blessing has its origin in God. But then we need to receive that word of grace by faith. And then we move on into another level of grace. So you've got the gift of grace. You've got what Paul refers to in Romans chapter 5 and verse 17 as the abundance of grace. Paul, um, or it's almost as though he's searching for bigger and better words to express the fullness of what God has done. Now we're into the abundance, the overflowingness of grace. And he speaks about the gift of righteousness. Not only righteousness reckoned to our account. Not just, not just the accounts being brought into balance and made put, put right, but the gift of righteousness, so that, to use the theological language, righteousness is not only imputed, it is imparted. God actually gives us his righteousness, so that there's a change in our constitution. And then Paul says, he goes on to say, that the consequence of that is that we reign in life. That's a contrast with another reign that we shall see a bit more of in a moment. And he spoke, speaks about justification by life. Here's an interesting thing, and I, I've never been able to kind of work out or discover where this came from. But if you know anything about printing, you just a little bit about printing, you know that there's a way that printers use of making sure that the lines not only begin in a kind of a vertical line, but that at the end of the paragraph, they end as well. And they call that justification. That's the printer's term for it. Squaring everything up. Getting everything right. I don't know what, if that's where they got it from or not, but to me it's an amazing thing. But it isn't just the accounts that are squared up. It's our lives that are squared up. God brings our lives into conformity with his purposes as a result of what Christ has done on the cross. And then you've got this statement here when it says that we are made righteousness. We are made righteous. That's, that's the same idea of being reconstituted so that we're no longer what we were. Okay. Um, and all men are either in Adam or in Christ. We said this, but I really want to say this again because what I'm emphasizing here is that human beings were designed to have one nature. In fact, all creatures are designed to have one nature. 
Um, that nature can be changed. There's a, a fascinating story in the book of Daniel where it tells of um, Nebuchadnezzar and his pride. And it says that Nebuchadnezzar was boasting, walking about his domains, and kind of boasting about everything that he'd done. And that the angel watchers saw him. And they kind of decreed that uh, if he didn't humble himself, uh, that he, he would suffer consequences for it. And Nebuchadnezzar didn't humble himself. And the Bible then says this. This is the language it uses. It says, and there was given to him the heart of a beast. Very interesting language. And when he had the heart of a beast, Nebuchadnezzar behaved as a beast. Because we live our lives in a pattern that is really determined by the nature of our heart. So if we have a heart that is deceitful, constantly wicked, never, never really submitting to the will of God, that will have its inevitable outcome in the way that we live our lives. But if, moving from Jeremiah and into Ezekiel, you, we begin to talk about a new heart, we discover that there's a possibility of a new nature. And Ezekiel is wonderfully uh, explicit in the way that it, he says um, uh, I don't want to be kind of provocative but um, Ezekiel be believes in replacement he says God takes away the stony heart and he puts in a heart of flesh so you never have two hearts at the same time one is removed and the other one is changed so these are radical differences so these are mutually exclusive conditions you are, all men are either in Adam, or they're in Christ. And uh, the culmination of all that is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul writes, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. There are lots of verses in the scripture which speak of this absolute transformation from one thing to another. I don't know whether you've got tired of me yet quoting 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Uh, where it says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he has become a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Uh, listen to the order. Old things have passed away. All things are become new. God has to bring the old to an end before he can bring in the new. That's why we need a baptism that baptizes us into death before it brings us through into his life. That brings the old to an end. That's, we'll see more about that in a moment. And this is another kind of verse showing that absolute transformation from one state to another. <clears throat> he has delivered us. This is Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us or translated us, the old King James Version says, into the kingdom of the son of his love. And uh, John in his writings uh, says this. We know that we've passed from death to life. Not our passing have past we've moved from one state to another state because we love the brethren <clears throat> a he do, who does not love his brother abides in death he says okay this is just by way of illustration for a, a little while i taught at a secondary school and i taught business studies um and it was, it was very interesting. And one of the things I had to teach the young people was about different kinds of business organization and how you can have what they call a sole trader or you can have a partnership or you can have a, a limited company of different kinds. And the interesting thing is, is that when two people join together into a partnership, it brings into existence something that lawyers call a new legal entity. It brings into being something which the law can see and can tax, <laughs> amongst other things. Uh, it'll have privileges, it'll have maybe tax breaks, and it'll have uh, um, kind of obligations and responsibilities as well. And this sort of idea of an entity where two or more people are joined together but are treated as one by the law, I think may be a kind of a, a useful illustration 
for us to understand now as we move from Adam and Christ as individuals and we begin to think of Adam and Christ as federal heads of their races so that the whole of Adam's race was in Adam and the whole of Christ's race are in Christ. And you cannot be in both of these men at the same time. And we need some work of God's Spirit that will take us out of the one and put us in the other. Otherwise, we shall live a life which is just schizophrenic. Um, we will live a life that is just being torn in two directions at the same time. Okay, so there's a sense in which because Adam was the federal head of the human race, what he did affected the whole race. Because if, if, um, if uh, Lucy and I were together in a partnership um, and I did something that was against the law, the partnership would be held responsible. Lucy would be held responsible as well as me because it's a legal entity that's come into existence and that's the way it works. And there's a, a, there's a legal entity that is a, a solidarity in Adam's race, that the whole human race, God sees them as individuals, but he also sees them as one in Adam. And there were consequences of what Adam did that have affected the whole human race. Okay. And so we're coming now to have a look at this question of the story of the two men, the old and the new men. So we're going to look at the old entity and the new entity. And I'm going to um, read a passage of scripture from the King James Version. This is, um, if you've got your Bible, this is Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 1 to, um, we'll see in a minute how what it is. Paul says this, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, the King James Version there I think says planted together. I'll explain what, why the New King James goes in this direction when we get there. For we have been united together in the likeness of his death. Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin, literally justified from sin, leveled up, squared up from sin, sin's over. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We'll kind of come back to that passage of Scripture uh, in a little while. Okay. We're continuing really the story of these two men and its implications. And we're coming now to the part where Paul is beginning to apply this and say, well, okay, this is an interesting theory, but what impact does this have on our lives? What so what? This is, this is fascinating stuff, maybe, for some people. For some people, it isn't fascinating stuff at all. It just bores them to death. Um, but if, if so, what, what are the implications of it? How does this affect the way we live our lives? 
And he starts that in chapter 6, and he says, um, like we read together, he says, well, if this is the case, do we remain in sin? Do we continue in sin so that grace can abound? Can I presume on grace uh, to keep coming to my rescue if I keep on sinning? If this is the way it works, is that the way, it, is that the way it's going to be? And Paul uses this word in the King James Version. It says, God forbid. The Greek language just simply says, no way. That's really the implication of it. Uh, by no means, under no circumstances. Um, and Paul says this, really. He says, um, we who died to sin, how shall we continue to live in it? He's, um, he's incredulous. He, uh, he's really saying, if you ask that question, you haven't begun to understand what I'm talking about yet. There's no possibility of you taking that option if you understand what I've said. Only an ignorant man can ask that question. And then Paul says this. He says, he speaks about all we that were baptized into Christ Jesus. And this is again what I want to do a little bit of what I did the last time we were together. And just be sure that we know who Paul is talking to. He is not talking to anybody who happens to pick up the book with the letter to the Romans in it. He's speaking to people that he knows have had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. This is, there's a we here. Can you see this? We. I said this the last time. If I'm in this room and I say we, we've got something in common. We're all in this room together. We're all here during this period of time. When Paul says we, he knows he has something in common with the people he's speaking to. And he says this, all we that were baptized into Christ Jesus. What does he mean by being baptized into Christ Jesus? This really will be a crucial thing for us to understand. Many, many people, in fact, probably most evangelical Christians, when they come to this passage of Scripture, conclude that Paul is talking in some way about baptism in water, and that baptism in water is symbolically this, and that we should understand this. <coughs> but Paul does something different here to what is done in other parts of the Scripture. I mentioned this last time we were together. But frequently in the Acts of the Apostles, you get a reference to baptism in the name of Jesus. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't use the traditional Trinitarian formula. It's just a way of saying this is specifically Christian baptism and not the baptism of John, which was a baptism of repentance looking forward. This is a different kind of baptism to John's baptism. And when they want to say that, they refer with this little phrase when it says they were baptized in the name of. But there are two occasions in Paul's letter where he doesn't speak about being baptized in the name of or coming under the authority of. He actually speaks about being baptized into the person of. One is here and the other one is in Galatians. He isn't speaking, in my understanding, of water baptism at all. Water baptism is a symbol and a metaphor and an illustration of this, but he's really speaking about another baptism. <clears throat> and it's, um, it's interesting that in, in chapter 6 and verse 4, Paul uses a phrase, um, he says, when we who were baptized into Christ were baptized uh, into his death. And literally the words speak of the baptism into the death. He has a particular baptism in mind. He isn't thinking about water baptism. He's thinking about another baptism. All we that were baptized into Christ Jesus. This is how you become one with Christ. This is how you are brought out of Adam and put into Christ by a baptism that is in spirit. John baptized in water. The medium that he immersed people into was water. Jesus baptizes in spirit. The medium that he baptizes into is spirit. There are different words that we've used over the years for this that have sometimes kind of caused confusion. Quite often people will speak about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Bible never uses that language. Because the baptism of the Holy Spirit would mean a baptism belonging to the Holy Spirit. But this baptism belongs to Jesus. He is the baptizer. He baptizes us 
into one spirit. He baptizes us into the spirit. That unites us with him and with his father. And it also unites us with all those who are already united with him and his father. So it puts us into that unique relationship with God. And it puts us into the unique relationship with one another. That we understand the word church really means. I'm not thinking about a local church. I'm thinking about the whole church of Jesus Christ. All we that were baptized into Christ Jesus, he says. And then he goes on and says that we were baptized into his death. And Paul uses this language as well. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 5. And you saw it in the version that I was using. Um, when he said we become united with him. Um, it's, it's an agricultural term. That's why it's sometimes uh, referred to as kind of planted together. But it's a word that came to mean united. And it's a, it's a, it's a graphic picture of what the Bible's understanding of baptism is all about. One of the central truths about baptism in the Bible is that it unites one thing with another thing. We talked the last time, didn't we, about babto and baptizo, about the difference between blanching and marinating, um, saturating something so that it becomes absolutely one, so that there's no way of distinguishing between where the one ends and the other begins. So baptism in the Spirit unites us with Jesus Christ. It makes us one with him, wonderfully, wonderfully one with him. And it makes us one with one another, which is why when Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he said, be careful to maintain the unity of the Spirit. He didn't say be careful to create the unity of the Spirit, because he knows we can't do that. That is accomplished by having been baptized into one Spirit. But having been baptized into one Spirit, we have an obligation to be diligent in maintaining the unity of the Spirit, living the life that God has given us to live. And if you think about this, you, you know that he isn't speaking here about water baptism, simply because other than Catholics, Roman Catholics, and possibly Anglo-Catholics, I don't know of anyone who believes that being dipped into water unites a person with Christ. Are you following me? I think I've said this before, or, or the only change you get, if that's all that's happened, the only change you get is you now have a wet sinner rather than a dry sinner. That's, that's the only difference that's taken place. Baptism in water does not unite a person with Christ. Baptism in spirit does unite a person. And there are amazing implications that follow on from that. And uh, here's the other place where Paul uses that kind of language in Galatians 3, verse 27. He says, for as many of you as were baptized, not into the name of, but as baptized into Christ Jesus, have put on Christ. If you have put on Christ, in relationship to Christ, where are you? You're inside him. Aren't you? If I put on something, I'm on the inside of it. This baptism puts people onto the inside of Christ. This is Jesus Christ. Fulfilling his wonderful destiny. This is what John the Baptist said. John the Baptist saw two unique roles for Jesus. Uh, and he used a particular kind of way of expressing it. And he said, this is the carrier away of the world's sin. This is the Lamb of God. And he also said, this is the in-spirit baptizer. He said two things. That the, these are his... You could almost say this is, this is the cross and Pentecost. This is what he came to do. He came to take away sin. But he also came to uh, make a brand new beginning. Um, and baptize people in the spirit. Okay. If you're thinking about baptism having the effect of uniting. It'll be good just briefly to think again of. Um, the language that Jesus used before his cross. Do you remember how he said to his disciples, can you be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Do you remember that language? Now, there's no doubt about it that he is speaking about his Calvary baptism. 
And in what happened on the cross, he was united with something. Uh, yes, he bore in his body our sins, but he became united with something. And I think it's a question that isn't asked often enough. What did he become united with in his Calvary baptism? If when I am baptized into the Spirit, I become united with God, if I become united with Christ, when he was baptized on the cross, what was he united with? Well, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, a little bit farther on from my favorite verses, um, and verse 21. It says this, For this is God, for he made him, the him is Christ, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus didn't just bear the penalty for sin. He didn't just bear sin in his body on the tree. There is this amazing flash of revelation that comes through here with Paul's writing. And he says, he who knew no sin became sin. He was united into what the human race had become. He became what we had become. What the human race had become as a result of Adam's sin, Jesus was immersed into it and bore the penalty for it upon the cross and took it down into death with him. <clears throat> Have I told you the story of Tarka the Otter? Yes, I have, but I'll tell it you again, just in case you've forgotten. There's a, this is a, a, a lovely story, Talk of the Otter. It's a kind of a book um, by a man who wrote a story about an otter. He starts off with the, the otter as a baby pup, um, and it kind of grows, and it goes through different experiences of life. And Talker has a mortal enemy. In fact, the whole of Talker's family has a mortal enemy. Enemy, and I think his name is Dreadlock or Dreadnought or something like that. And he is the, the pack leader of the Otter Hounds um, in Devon, round Exmouth or somewhere, that kind of area, I think. Um, and as the story goes on, uh, the Otter Hound attacks Talker's family several times. His father is killed by the, the, the Otter Hound, and his mother is killed, and I think one of his uh, mates is killed. And then as the story goes on and Tarka has had his own kind of pups, there's a time when the otter pack, the otter hound pack, begin to chase uh, Tarka. And they chase him from the river and into, um, into the salt water of the sea. I think this is sort of North Devon. So it's not Exmouth, is it? It's whatever's up there anyway, that part of North Devon. Um, and as they chase the otter hound, I'll call him Dreadnought, um, he lunges at Tarka um, and the watchers on the seashore um, they, they see um, this great kind of commotion in the water and then they see Tarka kind of rise up and he grips the throat of the, the otter hound and they sink down into death together and there's this amazing picture where they, the writer says, this is why I wish I could do poetry. <clears throat> the writer says, there was just one big black bloody bubble. And then another bubble. And it was over. over. And Tarka had taken down into death with him. The enemy of Tarka's race. What happened on the cross was Jesus took down into death with him. He used Satan's tool. He, he, he took death from him that had the power of death and brought his uh, kingdom to ruin with it. It's like the picture of David and Goliath. David stunned Goliath with the stone, but he actually killed Goliath with Goliath's own sword, with his own weapon. And Jesus destroyed the power of the enemy in the human race. Brought it to, I'll explain what destroyed means in a minute. Brought it to an end uh, in this way because he was baptized into it and took it down into death with it. 
he became what we had become. And Calvary was Christ's ultimate identification with the human race. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we watched here the, kind of the, the nativity thing, and that's his beginning of his identification with the human race. The word is made flesh. And then he comes through, and his ultimate identification with the human race is on the cross. And he is baptized into what the human race has become. He brought Adam's race to an end. But only in himself. I'll explain how that works out in a minute. Um, this is the verse. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. And that's what I was meaning when I said that the the words literally there say he was buried with him through the baptism into the death. It's a, a particular thing it's kind of focusing on. We were buried with him. There's, there's a way that the language here is used which is really very wonderful. And I don't want to get too technical, but it really is thrilling. So I want to sort of try at least to explain what happens. There's a Greek preposition <clears throat> which is S-U-N, sun, and it means together with. Um, it's the word that we, or it's the kind of the, it's, it's the, it's the little bit of the word that we have in words like synchronize and synergy and sympathy and synthesize. It actually means things are together. They are, well, that's it. They are together. They are absolutely kind of together. And Paul puts this S-U-N word in front of the word burial here. So that this actually says, we were sin, S-Y-N, sin buried with him. Now that isn't going to work. So let's try another word. We were co-buried with him. When he was buried, we were co-buried with him. Not as a separate personal experience. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> um, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Um, and then a little bit later on, just a few verses later, uh, he uses this S-U-N word again. And here it's in the word crucify. And he says, knowing this, that our old man was co-crucified with him and when Paul comes into um, Ephesians and you know he begins to speak about us having died with him and being raised with him <clears throat> and being seated in the heavenly places with him it's all this s-u-n prefix all the way through co 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 these things are true because God has a way of getting us into Christ and just as when the onion has been baptizoed into its marinade, it gathers all the experiences of the previous days when you've been mixing up your flavors, and now it becomes one with them. So all the things that have happened to the flavors now become the experience objectively of the onion. Do you understand that? Is that too complicated? Okay, I won't go over it again. If I'll find another way of explaining it some other time. <clears throat> Knowing this, Paul says, <clears throat> that our old man was co-crucified so that the body of sin might be done away. This is really a very wonderful thing. And what God does is he puts us into Christ. But he puts us into the Christ who has his own history. Christ history is that he died to sin. He finished with sin. Christ's history is that he took it down into death with him. Christ's history is that he rose from the dead. Christ's history is that he was raised from the earth to heaven in ascension and sat down at the right hand of God. The spirit that we are baptized in is the spirit who has all those experiences in his history. 
I am baptized into a Christ who has died to sin, who has been buried, who has been raised, who has been put at the right hand of the Father. I am baptized into this person. So all these things that he experienced subjectively, I receive objectively because he puts me into Christ. And this, this isn't just fancy theology. This is really wonderful. As long as we live in the light of it. We need this revelation and we need God. This is why Paul is always asking for revelation. He's asking that the churches will have revelation. That their inward eyes will be open. He knows that if you see these things. If you glimpse what God has done. It will transform the way in which we live our lives. If this is true then we don't need to live the kind of lives we've lived up until this point. If this is true, let's kind of work our way on from it here. Um, <clears throat> knowing this, that our old man was co-crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. That idea of co-crucified is used two or three times elsewhere in the Scriptures, and this will give you an idea of uh, what the word means. This is from the Gospels. The soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who were co-crucified with him. That's the word that's used. This is, um, this is Paul giving his testimony in Galatians. I have been co-crucified with Christ. You see, this is Paul's testimony. Paul has two testimonies. He has one testimony in the first chapter of Galatians where he'll tell you that he was a religious leader, that he excelled, that he was better than all the others, um, and that he persecuted the church. And then you'll find another testimony, and his second testimony is this, because I was co-crucified with Christ, the life that I now live in the flesh. It's quite different. It's, it's quite different. These are wonderful ideas. Um, this, this is the verse we need to have a look at. Knowing this, and this is why I've been kind of laboring maybe a little bit, because I want you to know this. Um, not academically, not as a theory. Um, and it's why I'm praying as I'm preaching, because I know that only God can give us this glimpse of what God has done. And when, when you see this, it will change everything. Let me give you another illustration. The people of Israel, for, for the whole of their remembered history, had only ever known slavery in Egypt. Four generations. Grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And all the way back, they'd never known anything except bondage. But a time came when they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And part of the effect of that baptism was that the power that had held them was broken forever as regards them. And the Bible tells us that they went to uh, the seashore and they saw the bodies of the Egyptians floating downwards in the water. Now, if you'd been one of Israel's mothers and your children had been frightened by knocks on the door in the middle of the night, wondering if they were going to be thrown to the crocodiles and all the rest of it, you imagine what it would do to you if your mother took you down to look at the bodies of your ancient oppressors, dead in the water, no longer with any power to harm you. You don't have to look over your shoulder ever again. You don't have to be afraid of a knock on the door in the middle of the night. This is why I say playfully that I wonder whether one of the mothers of Israel maybe said something like, it's all become new. All things have all passed away. All things become new. This is brand new. This, this is a way of life that you've never seen. Uh, your parents haven't seen it. Your grandparents haven't seen it. Your great-grandparents haven't seen it. Four generations. They've only ever known slavery. But now that's over. It's over. There's, there's all this new for you. But if you hadn't seen that, you might think, well, I wonder if they'll come and get me. I wonder if they're hiding around the next corner. I wonder whether they'll come, what they'll come and do. So this is why we need to see in our spirits. We need 
the eyes of our hearts and our understanding open so that we can see what God has done. And by putting us in Christ in spirit, he makes these things our testimony too. So that Satan has no power over us. He has no right to control or direct our lives in any measure at all. And knowing this, that our old man was crucified, co-crucified, so that the body of sin, and now Paul begins to speak about the old man. Um, previously he'd spoken about the individual Adam. Now he's speaking really about the corporate entity. He's speaking about the whole human race. And he says, our old man, our plural, old man singular. This, this isn't our old man, this is our old man. This is that solidarity in the human race. This is that single entity. That God has done something in Christ that has brought the power of that to an end. Or as the old King James Version says, destroyed. This version here says, done away. It's a wonderful word. It's, um, it's a word that Paul uses quite often in his writings. It, it, it means this. <clears throat> it, it's cat ergeo. You know, the er, ergos is work, like uh, ergonomics. So if something works, that would be kind of ergo. If something doesn't work, you put an A in front of it, like you put an A in front of atheist, and that cancels out the work. So it doesn't work. If you want to say something thoroughly doesn't work in Greek, you put another prefix in front of it, which is kata. So this is thoroughly not working. In other words, rendered inoperable. It does not work. It isn't annihilated in the sense that the old man doesn't exist. The old man as a spiritual entity does exist. The rest of Adam's race is still part of it. But those who are in Christ have been brought out of it. And it no longer has any power to control us. The old man is actually the ancient man. He's been, he's, up to now he's been talking about Adam. Now he refers to the old man. It's this is the Greek word paleos that we get kind of paleontology from. It's the ancient man. The ancient man. The spiritual entity that came into being as the result of Adam's sin. By first natural birth, every human being is part of this entity. Um, <clears throat> and then Paul speaks about God has done that in order that the purpose of him bringing that to barrenness so that it no longer functions, it no longer operates, is so that the body of sin, he says here, um, might be, um, the body of sin might be done away. Our old man was co-crucified so that the body of sin might be done away, made inoperable. So what does Paul mean by the body of sin? I think many people would say, well, he, he really means our bodies dominated by sin. I'm not so sure that he does in this context. I think maybe he's still thinking about this entity, this legal entity that is Adam's family, that is the body of sin. If you like, it's a mystical body. It's a satanic counterfeit of the body of Christ. It's, it's a group of people united under one head, indwelt by the wrong spirit. That's as I see the body of sin. And it no longer operates for those who've been taken out of it. Its, um, it's power is rendered non-operational. Um, we're not going to have time to finish what I wanted to do. But I'm just going to say, I'll just take one of these things for uh, a thing for a time for action, and then we'll move on to it the next time. I need to read another little bit of the scripture from Romans 6 and chapter 12 sorry chapter chapter 6 and verse 12 I'm going to read to verse 14 therefore so remember I keep on saying that whenever you read the word therefore in the Bible you should ask the question what is it therefore in other words therefore means what we're going to say now is based on the foundation of what I've just said. So that being the case, if all that is true, what I've just said now, therefore, 
Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. You see, now he's talking about a physical body. Now he's talking about a mortal body. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of righteousness. I'm going to leave that part. But I just want to say this first bit about do not let sin reign. When we are brought into Christ, when we are made new, when we become a new creation in Christ, God doesn't take away our responsibility. When he made the human race, he made us so that we would live our lives by cooperating, by receiving truth that he spoke to us, by receiving the gifts of his grace by faith. So it was always intended to be by grace through faith. That was how Adam was intended to live. By grace through faith. That's the pattern. God initiates it. We respond to what God has said. That's the way it works. And it's just exactly the same in the new covenant. In this new man. Because if God changed that, he would actually change the whole basis of his relationship with the human race. Which is that he wants to do things as a result of cooperation. He does not impose upon us. He does not force us to do things that we don't want to do. He doesn't make us conform to his way of seeing truth and living our lives by main force. He gives us the grace, enables us to believe, enables us to repent, enables us to start again, but he doesn't force us. So that there's always a part in which the ball is back in our courts. God has done all these things. But now there's something that you must do. The first thing is. <clears throat> here it is. The first thing. My machine's gone to sleep. The first thing is that you. Um. You must not let sin reign in your mortal body. And you must reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. That, that simply means that you must bank on this. You must count on this. You must live your life in the light of this. Not, not in the light of a kind of a Bible truth that you found in Romans. But in the light of the revelation. In the light of the fact that he has put you into his son in the baptism in spirit. If that is true, if you are one of those who have been buried with him by this baptism into death, if you have become one with him in this nature of, of, of yours, then you must live your life based on that. You must live your life based on the fact that you're no longer what you used to be. You can live a different life. And all those commandments that seem to be almost like a cruel joke because you couldn't ever hope to do them, now become glorious promises. And the things where you, you hear God saying, Thou shalt not steal, and instead you say, Amen. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Amen. Thou shalt not cover. Amen. They all become enablings through His grace because of something that He's done. Let's stop. Lord, I'm... I am excited, Lord. I just glimpse again this glorious gospel. What you have done. You've covered all the bases, Lord. You've dealt with every single detail and you've left nothing to chance and nothing unnoticed. You've brought us, Lord, into something which is like a great feast perfectly prepared, complete and ready for us to enjoy all the benefits of your provision. We want to thank you again, Lord, just as we close for the sacrifice that made the feast possible. We want to thank you again, Lord, for the cross. I want to thank you, Lord, for things that were accomplished there that no eye, no human eye could ever see. No mind could ever understand. But things, Lord, that you speak to us of in Revelation. 
and we see the genuine passion of the Christ. We see you taking our ancient enemy down into death with yourself, breaking his power, making possible a new dawn for a new race of men and women no longer in Adam, but now in Christ. Oh Lord, make this so clear to our hearts. And then remind us, Lord, that that means we have an obligation to live differently. Because our abilities are different. We're not what we used to be. We're no longer our determination, our destiny is no longer determined by what we were. But a possibility opens up because of what we've become. Lord, work this out for us and Lord, take these broad truths and apply them, Lord, one by one to our hearts. Enable us, Lord, to live this new life for your glory. Amen. Amen.